design. Today we're going to be looking at perspective. We're going to be taking a brief look at this um, and we'll be looking at perspective and the way that it was developed across time. So the first form of perspective um, was isomorphic perspective uh, in which the face of the object is presented as a flat, it's parallel to the picture plane, and the sides do not recede into space. So the figure that you're looking at is from 1521 and they're architectural drawings. Um, these are two buildings you can see and below the buildings are their um, floor plans. So you can see that the top uh, left building is a square and the right building is a rectangle. Um, but the drawings of the buildings show the flat front of the building and then the sides projecting out. Now to us, we're used to one point or two point linear perspective, um, which is how we usually see objects being presented in art. Um, and so this might look to us more like a sort of trifold, like you're doing a, like a science fair project or something. Um, but you can see from the floor plans that, that it's not. The, the, the sides that you see going back at this um, oblique angle um, that don't recede as they move back, but move back at parallel oblique angles um, from the front, that these actually represent the sides of the buildings. Um, so this might be sort of confusing to us today, but back in 1521, this was how the drawings would have been presented. It, it made sense to, to present the images like this because it showed a fuller image of the building. Isomorphic perspective uh, is also called oblique projection. So this is uh, a section of a scroll called Night Attack at Sanjo Palace. Um, and you can see here, these two lines, how the front of the building in the, the bottom right corner is being shown to us as flat and parallel to the picture plane. Uh, but that as the building recedes back into space, it recedes at oblique parallel angles. These lines are parallel um, and they'll never recede to a point together like this. So a lot of um, Japanese scrolls are going to use this oblique projection or isom isomorphic perspective. Another sort of form of this or a development from this uh, it's called axonometric projection. Um, it's a technique for depicting space, often employed by architects, uh, in which all lines remain parallel rather than receding to a common vanishing point, as in linear perspective, which we'll look at soon. And you can see that this picture by Theo van Doesberg and Cornelius van Esteren, um, that this kind of drawing would lend itself um, very well to architectural drawings in which you're trying to show the, the floor plan in space, um, but you'll see that again, the left side and the right side of this of these forms recede at again parallel oblique lines. So nothing is going to move into a vanishing point, which is what we're more used to in one and two point linear perspective. So let's talk about one and two point linear perspective, which is, again, it's, it's something that we're, we're more used to seeing. Um, this idea of one point linear perspective was developed uh, in Italy uh, by this gentleman here, Filippo Brunelleschi. Um, this is a building that he designed, uh, the, the Duomo in Florence. 
It was also developed around the same time by a mathematician named Leon Battista Alberti. So Alberti and Brunelleschi developed this, uh, this plan for one point linear perspective. And for Brunelleschi, it was important uh, to develop this because he has the desire to show the buildings that he's designing to the client in a way that will more closely resemble the way that we see with our eyes. Now we'll explore why one and two point linear perspective don't actually really follow the way that our eyes work. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's an approximation of, of the way that, that eyes uh, work and take in space. So Brunelleschi is wanting to show his buildings uh, receding into space in his drawings um, to give his clients an, an idea of what they'll experience when they're looking at the building. And so one point linear perspective works like this. Um, you have a vanishing point which rests on a horizon line and you have um, lines that run and converge toward that vanishing point. Now, the vantage point is where we, the viewer, are situated in relation to the vanishing point. And this illustrates um, the use of the horizon line. You can see that objects that rest on the horizon line, you'll be able to see the sides of but you won't be able to see the top or bottom. Objects that rest below the horizon line, you'll be able to see both the sides and the top. And objects that rest above the horizon line, you'll be able to see the bottom and the sides of. But all of the, their front um, planes are gonna be presented as flat, parallel to the picture plane. So again, this is a sort of distortion that we take for granted in the use of linear perspective, um, this, this flattening out of the front side, and we'll show why that's, that's not actually true to our experience of space, um, which has to do with the fact that um, we have binocular vis vision, we have two eyeballs, um, unless one of your eyes are damaged and you're blind in one eye, in which you do have a single vantage point, um, which is what linear perspective is relying on is a, a single um, vantage point. Um, but also your eyes move. Even if you try to concentrate um, solely on a single point, which would be your vanishing point and linear perspective, your eyeball has a bit of um, wiggle to it. It can't remain constantly still, like say the way that um, a camera lens can. And so, you know, your vision isn't really the way that uh, linear perspective works. Your vision doesn't really work quite in that way. Again, this is an approximation, um, not, not a replacement for the real thing. So let's take our picture plane. Here I have a golden mean rectangle, and I'm going to find a horizon line. On that horizon line, I'm going to find a vanishing point here. Now this is where all of my lines are going to converge to. Um, I'm gonna drop down two lines from that vanishing point, making this triangle in the bottom here. And from that, um, I'm going to find on the, the bottom edge of my picture plane, the midpoint in between the intersection of these two lines. So this green line here, uh, intersects the bottom plane at the midpoint or the bottom edge at the midpoint between where my two other lines hit the, the bottom edge of my picture plane. This is the basic setup that you need to find receding regular intervals using one point linear perspective. Uh, we can say that we're going to create here um, a sidewalk or you could use this to create right um, like a um, checkered pattern, or you can use this if we tilt it, if we rotate it 90 degrees, you could use this to find regular intervals on buildings or the regular intervals of say like the spacing in between power lines or something like that. And I'll show you what I mean. So from my right red line that I've dropped down from my vanishing point, uh, where that intersects the bottom picture plane, 
I'm going to draw a line that crosses over that, mid, that middle green line and then intersects again the left red line. Now what this is going to do is going to be, it's going to provide me with two intersection points from which I will draw horizontal lines. The intersection point is going to be where that blue line crosses the middle green line and then intersects with the left red line. That's going to give me two lines right there. Okay, now from the first horizontal red line up from the bottom that I've just drawn, I'm going to draw another blue line that will intersect where that second red horizontal line intersected the green line there. So this is how you make sure that your diagonal lines are running parallel to each other because they'll always intersect the middle line at the point at which your last drawn horizontal line intersected. Where this line then again hits the left line, I'm going to draw another red horizontal line straight across like that. Now you can repeat this ad infinitum all the way back, but this is essentially how one point linear perspective works to push um, the idea of regular intervals in space moving back. And you'll notice that my intervals, as they step up from the bottom, grow smaller and smaller. Um, so this is a measure, let's say that, that this is a, a sidewalk, and this sidewalk, each section is 24 inches long. Um, well, in, in this one point linear perspective, each section will be 24 inches long, but projected out in this way, they'll get smaller and smaller as they move back towards the horizon line and the vanishing point. So one point linear perspective is essentially created using very simple geometric ideas um, to create space that moves back. And here again, I can repeat um, my previous steps to find my next step back in space. And you can do this over and over and over again, pushing it back further into space. So pretty simple. Um, I, I'm not trying to get too caught up into this. You might work with uh, linear perspective and drawing class. Um, you might not. It has specific purposes. Again, Brunelleschi used it um, for his architectural drawings, and that's why he wanted it, was to show this um, uh, architectural forms in space to his clients. And we have examples in art history that we're going to look at um, that use one-point linear perspective. But again, um, you know, these artists aren't beholden to this idea of linear perspective as something that they have to follow. Um, it's easy to think about uh, an image like this by Duccio uh, that we looked at last time, the Annunciation of the Death of the Virgin. Here we have an analysis of the perspective that's being used here, and you can see that none of the lines go back to a single vanishing point. This painting was made before the development of one-point linear perspective in the 1300s. And so it's easy to look at this and think, uh, wow, this is really primitive, right? It's naive. Um, but the truth is that uh, images don't have to follow this rule of linear perspective. Uh, it's a tool that was developed by Brunelleschi and Alberti, but it's not necessarily a progression forward uh, in terms of design or, or drawing or anything like that. Um, and this space that Duccio has created, although the lines don't push back to a single vanishing point, serve Duccio's purposes perfectly. He doesn't have to follow one point linear perspective. It's, it's not necessary um, for this image. And we've looked at this image before uh, last time as well, um, the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. And we saw how he's using, yes, one point linear perspective but that the vanishing point here um, is actually the right temple of Christ. 
Um, so he's pushing everything back to this single vanishing point, but the vanishing point lies at the closest figure to the viewer here. So using this, these rules of one-point linear perspective, and you can see the use um, on the ceiling above of how he's creating, he's using those regular intervals to push things back in space. But again, that vanishing point that it lies on the figure that's closest to us is both creating depth and canceling out depth and flattening the picture back to the flat picture plane again. Uh, here is uh, the painting by Masaccio, um, the Holy Trinity, which we looked at before as well. And here is a one point linear perspective analysis of that painting. And you can see the ceiling that is above Christ and uh, God there, uh, the way that it uses that one point linear perspective um, to create regular intervals moving back in space. The interesting thing here with this painting is that the vanishing point lies on that line um, about two thirds of the way down there. You can see where the vanishing point is. Now, this is interesting because if we, if we take this image and we imagine it as an actual three dimensional thing, um, that does move back in space, and then it's not just a flat painting on a, on a flat surface. Um, but if we look at this in terms of how it works three-dimensionally, then we can see that this red line here, this represents the line of the viewer's eye, which directly coincides with the, the horizon line of this image where the vanishing point is. So, what this does in terms of design, in terms of visual communication, this red horizon line where the vanishing point is, again, if that's where our eye is, then it means that we are looking up to the images of Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit and the uh, saints on either side. And then we are looking down at the image of the sarcophagus, the image of death below us. Um, so Masaccio is using um, the vanishing point and the horizon line of the image to actually direct our vision and to give us a different experience of uh, two parts of a single image. We've seen this image before as well. Uh, this is Leonardo's uh, The Annunciation. And again, I want to show you how Leonardo is using linear perspective, um, but he's not really following the rules here. So I'm going to follow some, some of these um, receding lines, the angles of the receding lines of the objects that he's presented us. And all these lines push back to a single vanishing point back there. And the blue line represents the horizon line. But you'll notice if you look at the left side of the image, um, there's a little vista that exists behind and um, below the angel's wings there, where you can actually see the painted horizon. And the horizon there is below the horizon that he's using, this blue line, where the vanishing point exists. So again, he's using these, this tool of one-point linear perspective, but he's not totally adhering to the rules because it's, it's not necessary to, and actually he's creating a more dynamic image by breaking these rules here. Um, and you can see also um, this really ornate desk that Mary is sitting at. Um, the way that the front plane of it is presented to us again in that parallel fashion to the picture plane, that it's absolutely flat on the picture plane. This shows the limits of one point linear perspective. This following image is gonna show that a little bit more clearly. Here is a drawing of another sarcophagus. Um, and you can see the, the distortion that starts to happen, especially if you push the vanishing point all the way 
to the left or right. This one pushes it all the way to the left here. And it shows us the sarcophagus uh, front as being completely flat against the picture plane. And then moving back, we see the side, uh, the, the left side of it moving back into space. Um, so adhering so closely to the rules of one point linear perspective has actually created a real distortion in the image here. Um, this isn't how we would actually see this in space. That front uh, plane of the sarcophagus that's presented so flatly here in this drawing, we would actually see that receding away from us as well. I mean, take any um, box that you might uh, have sitting around. Um, I don't know if you have like a shelf or um, uh, a box that you ordered something in recently and, and take a look at that and look directly at the front plane of it. If you're seeing the front plane of that box as an absolute square, then you can't actually see the side or top or bottom. And the second that you move to see either side or the top and bottom of that box, then that front plane will actually start to recede away from you as well. So what do we do in this situation? Okay, uh, this, this image obviously has a lot of distortion to it. Uh, well, we have to now create a new system of linear perspective called two-point linear perspective, um, which is shown in this drawing here, in which, yes, you have two vanishing points. Um, so we have a street corner here, we have a car and some buildings, and you can see um, that either side moves away and the, the lines converge at those two vanishing points there. So two-point linear perspective. Um, and we can see some examples of that in some art here. Um, this is an, an analysis of a painting by Gustav I'm not gonna try to pronounce that French last name because I'm going to butcher it, but you can read it there. And you can see the, the top left building here is being presented in two-point linear perspective. Um, so the use of that here in this image. And here we have uh, the painting, uh, The School of Athens by Raphael. Um, and he's going to be using one-point linear perspective, but he's also going to be using two-point linear perspective. Uh, if we take a look at the cube that the gentleman is resting on in the very front of the image, its sides are receding to two vanishing points, but these two vanishing points don't rest on the horizon line that Raphael has presented us with. So Raphael, again, is using, he's using two systems of perspective in this um, in this painting, and he's not following totally the rules of it either here. So again, perspective is a tool to be used in drawings and design, um, but it's not something to be um, beholden to as an absolute rule. Um, these things can and should be broken when it serves the image uh, more than, than just following these, these rules blindly. Uh, or you can do something like this, uh, by this painting by Giorgio de Chirico, in which uh, you see the, the wagon there um, that's using isomorphic perspective. The front of it is flat against the picture plane, and its sides um, move back at, uh, at oblique parallel angles, uh, so it doesn't converge at a vanishing point. But the building that it's next to uses one-point linear perspective, but its vanishing point is going to rest somewhere on the ground. And then the building that is to the left of that has another vanishing point that exists above the horizon line. De Chirico is using multiple vanishing points and multiple systems of perspective because he is a surrealist artist. He's creating a space that um, ends up reading in a very dreamlike way. It, it makes sense upon first glance, but the more that you look at it, things seem a little off and it doesn't make total sense anymore. So this is appropriate for the paintings that De Chirico is making um, because he is a surrealist. Here's an example of the use of uh, one-point linear perspective by Edward Hopper here. And you can see 
um, that he's using one point linear perspective in a rather interesting way. Uh, here's this woman at a cafe, there's a window behind her and you're seeing the reflection of the room in the window. You can see the reflection of the lights on the ceiling, which are obviously using linear perspective. But that linear perspective is being presented to us as a flat reflection. So Hopper is, again, giving us space and canceling it, flattening it out at the same time. He's having his cake and eating it too. This is the tension between depth and space and the flatness of the picture plane being expressed here in this painting. Or you can do something like uh, Matthias Weischer is doing here in this painting. This is a contemporary painter. And you can see he's using a lot of grid patterns to push back into space. Um, you, the use of one point linear perspective and this, these grid patterns to move back at regular intervals. Um, but then he's breaking up these grid patterns, uh, intersecting it with different patterns um, and actually just cr creating a large confusion in terms of the use of perspective um, to both give space and to flatten out at the same time to the point that some of these grid patterns you can see like in the um, woven basket that shows up in the, the front center of the image that the grid pattern moves to on top of the, that basket there. So just a sort of confusion of perspective there. Or you can do something like um, David Hockney is doing here, where he's actually using two-point linear perspective. You can see the way that the, the shape of the two couches here move back and will have two vanishing points on either side of them. Um, so he, he's creating a sense of depth for the room, but then he's using this heavy insistence on pattern, um, and pattern flattens out space. So the repeated pattern of the books on the shelf in the back brings the space forward. The pattern on the floor tilts the floor up towards the viewer and the stripes on the couch as well helps to flatten out that image. So again, the tension between depth and the flatness of the picture plane. Here's another image by Hockney. Uh, this is a collage instead of a painting here. So um, every photograph, is going to have a vanishing point that is that lies directly in the center of the image because that's how the the camera lens works uh, the camera lens works as a single fixed eye that is always looking directly forward and so here hockney has created an image that has a hundred or more vanishing points in it. So the use of one point linear perspective all over the place that actually ends up creating in the end a very flat um, and dynamic image. All right, so for your homework, studio problem number 14. Using narrow dark lines in a golden mean format, that's the one to 1.618, you might need to review the proportion lecture uh, if you need to go over how to create a golden mean format rectangle. Create a unity of shape and a modulation of size from the format. So the format having a ratio of one to 1.618 or five to eight. Your shapes should modulate in size according to that proportional system. But also, I want you to do something else, which is I want you to repeat the primary, secondary, and tertiary shapes. I'm gonna go over with you what that means. And I want 10 thumbnails and 10 variations. So if I look at this golden mean rectangle that's been broken down according to its proportional breaks, then the primary shape is going to be the shape of the rectangle as a whole. So that golden mean format itself is the primary shape. So you'll need to repeat that shape within the image. The secondary shape is the shape that you get when you cut the rectangle at its proportional break. So this square, on the right side of this 
of this rectangle, the square is the secondary shape. That might lead you to think that then the tertiary shape is the rectangle that is created on the left side. But actually, that left-hand rectangle is just another repetition of the primary shape. So how do you find the tertiary shape? I'm going to take this line here, this proportion break of the rectangle, and I'm going to pull it all the way across the rest of the rectangle to create then this long skinny rectangle. This long skinny rectangle in red is your tertiary shape. So the primary shape is the rectangle itself as a whole and that proportion. The secondary shape is the square on the right side and the tertiary shape is the long rectangle here outlined in red. And I'm going to show you how that can be repeated within your image using the image that we looked at at the beginning. So first I'm going to take a golden mean rectangle. I'm then going to place another golden mean rectangle on top of that so that it intersects at the point of the proportional break like this. This is going to give me the overall shape of the canvas of this painting by Carrie James Marshall that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture. I'm also going to be showing you here how he's using the underlying geometry of the picture plane to find the location and orientation of the elements within the painting. So, if I take this shape that I've created by placing two golden mean rectangles on top of each other that intersect at the proportional break, then I'm going to take a square off the right side of this image. And from that square, I'm going to find the diagonal that runs from the top left to the bottom right, like this. And I'll see that this diagonal coincides directly with the angle of the rake that the gentleman in the center of the painting is holding. I'm going to do the same thing on the left side. I'm going to find the square that I can cut off of the left side, and I'm going to find the diagonal that runs from the bottom left to the top right, and I'll see that this line runs directly parallel to the arm of the gentleman on the bottom left who is working in the flower bed there. So again, using the underlying geometry of the picture plane to find the location of elements within the picture. Okay, so first I need to figure out how and where Kerry James Marshall is repeating the primary shape. Here, our primary shape, um, and the one that you're going to be using, is the shape of the golden mean rectangle. An easy way to repeat shapes within a format is just to find the diagonal of that shape. So here's a diagonal of the top golden mean rectangle that he's using in this image. And then I'm then going to find a rectangle um, of which two of its corners will coincide with this diagonal shape here, like this. Now, when you create a rectangle that whose opposite corners coincide with a diagonal of the shape overall, then this rectangle that you created is going to be a perfect repetition of that shape, of whatever shape you've created the diagonal from. So this red rectangle that I now have here is a smaller golden mean rectangle. Okay, so I'm going to take and I'm going to move this golden mean rectangle, this small red golden mean rectangle, and I'm going to place it on a proportion break. I'm going to place it on this proportion break right here.
and I'll see that Marshall has repeated the primary shape. Now you might be saying, okay, well, wait a minute, this welcome to sign here isn't as large as the rectangle that you've created. That's true. So Marshall is using what's called implied lines. Here we have the shape of the welcome sign like this. Okay, but Marshall is going to extend that through implied lines by finding the tie of this gentleman here. And so this then, the overall shape that is being created there is a repetition of the primary shape of the format that's being created through the use of implied lines which complete the shape even though that shape might be hidden a little bit. So we know that the secondary shape of a five by eight format of a golden mean rectangle is the square. So Marshall here has created this corner right here. He's going to create a square that moves off of that corner and comes all the way down here to this proportion break right there. And that's the repetition of the secondary shape within his painting. You'll see then that the shoulder of this gentleman on the right coincides with, with this square shape, as does the placement of his knee right there. Again, this falls on the proportional break right here uh, and coincides with this corner that he's created here. So again, this is an implied shape. It's a more hidden shape, but it is still a compositional shape that he's using. And he's using the underlying geometry of the picture plane to find it. So now I have the repetition of the primary shape and the secondary shape. I now need the tertiary shape, which if you'll, you'll remember is this rectangle right here. Okay, so I'm gonna find the diagonal of that rectangle, and I'm going to find a rectangle that has two opposing corners that lie on that diagonal. And it is here, IL222, which is the number of the housing project um, that Marshall is making this painting of. This is from a series of paintings. This painting is called Many Mansions. It's from a series of paintings of um, housing projects in Chicago. So I have here the repetition of the primary shape. I have this square here, the repetition of the secondary shape, and I have here the repetition of the tertiary shape. Now you'll find that Marshall is going to do this in more than one location so that this bush here contains the primary shape, the tertiary shape here, and the secondary shape there. The secondary shape, and this gentleman on the, the bottom left here, his head creating this square like that. You'll find more and more complex uses of the primary, secondary, and tertiary shapes in this image. And I guarantee you that there's even more use of the underlying geometry of the picture plane. Marshall is a master at geometry in his paintings. Um, and so the, this is a really good person to look to, uh, especially the, the use of um, maybe a geometry that's not uh, apparent when you look at the image by itself like this. All of this hidden geometry is just that. It's, it's hidden within the image itself. It's not quite so apparent at the beginning. And that's the real trick of, of design, um, is to use this underlying geometry, um, but use it in a way that um, is hidden from your viewer, uh, more than just immediately apparent to them. Um, because the, the work itself, this, this painting needs to carry an emotional resonance before anything else. It's not like this painting is powerful because it uses geometry necessarily. Um, it has a lot of content uh, and meaning in it um, that is powerful for the viewer, but it is made more powerful through these hidden means that the artist is employing. 
um, the placement of things is made more impactful through this geometry. So the use of the geometry has to sort of marry with the, the content. Uh, the, the geometry can't be forced onto the content. It, it has to meet the content where it is. Um, so again, another look at your homework using the golden mean format, unity of shape, modulation of size from the format, and repeat the primary, secondary, and tertiary shapes. 10 thumbnails, 10 variations. If you have any questions, send me an email.